So let me just start with, two, I'm going to go through two case studies. The first one is what we've been implemented in predictive risk modeling in Pittsburgh. So the second is a kind of theoretical model, which is possibly something that we are going to implement, which is much more problematic for a lot of reasons. So let me just back up here. What is predictive risk modeling? Predictive risk modeling in this context is an automated risk scoring tool which generates a risk score. So it's not, it's a risk model in that it's not an algorithm that tells you zero, one. Yes, this child will be maltreated. No, it won't. What it's doing is taking data and giving you a score of one to zero, which tells you the probability that this child will be maltreated. Now we've always been trying to figure out how at risk a child is. Our systems are doing this all the time. They're trying to figure out how at risk are a criminal is to come back to, uh, uh, from their break their parole. We're trying to assess risk all the time. There's theoretically two ways that we have traditionally tried to figure out the risk that a child will be maltreated. The first is clinical judgment. That is a social worker looks at this child and tries to think through what those risk factors are, what protective factors, and figure out what the score is. Now, this clinical judgment is used by social workers to figure out the risk of a child maltreatment, used by doctors to figure out whether a patient's at risk of a heart disease. We have clinical decision making everywhere. Clinicians are really good at being able to tell you what's going to happen to the patient in front of them in the next six days. They're very poor at being able to tell you what's going to happen to the person in front of them over the two-year period. Now, if you're in the business of prevention, which is what I am, I don't need to know what's going to happen to this child in six days because there's nothing I can do about it. What I need to do is get in front of a child who is at increased risk over two years. And that's what we call long arc risk. It's the risk of an event over a long period. And so we have been using clinical methods to try to get at that, which we know is very, very poor. The next type of approach we used was what's called actuarial models or checklists where we tell the clinician, the social worker, to ask a bunch of questions, tick boxes, and say if there's three risk factors, that child is at very high risk, if there's two, it's less, and so on. What the evidence says is that social workers change their answer so that the risk goal looks like what they believe it is. So the evidence is that these kinds of actuarial models are really clinical decisions. Because they look at their risk too and go, oh, that's a high, that child's not at risk, don't be ridiculous, they rub out some of the risk factors, but that's better. So we have humans who are basically subverting it. The third approach is using data we've already collected. Now, 10, 15 years ago, we hadn't collected much data. Now, we have collected a lot of data in our public <coughs> repositories, and the question that your minister was asking this morning, and all our ministers are asking, is we have so much data, why are we not using this data to try to understand and get in front of bad things that are happening to our people early in order to prevent it? So the advantages of this sort of predictive risk model is that it just, it's a computerized software or algorithm. It can be deployed straight away. It grabs data from data repositories and calculates a risk score. So the advantages is that it's the cost of every extra child being screened is zero. So you can go through and risk screen your whole population at zero cost. The risk score is a continuum. Why is that a good thing? Because I might only have five prevention slots. Those of you who know work in prevention know that prevention is really expensive. Whether you're gonna try to stop a, cr a criminal coming back to jail, whether you're trying to stop a, do a patient from coming back to hospital, whether you're trying to stop something, you can predict it, but to prevent it is quite expensive. So you might only have 10 people who you can give this expensive preventive service for. 
Well, the great thing is predictive risk modeling is that it identifies and ranks every single person potentially in your population from the most at risk of the thing you're trying to prevent to the least at risk of the thing you're trying to prevent. So if you've got 10 slots, you'll just read the list of the top 10 and say, I'll give it to those top 10. If you've got a thousand slots, you can read the list of the top thousand and say, I'm going to give it to those thousand people. So if you risk stratify your population using a predictive risk model, you can rank everyone according to the risk that they're going to have this event. It's also validated using the data that we're using. So as you see all this, it's, uh, I know some of this will all seem a bit foreign. When I go to the use case study, you'll see what I mean. The reason a lot of our community is uncomfortable with these sorts of tools is because they think it's a black box. When it was a social worker who said, I've got 10 prevention slots, I'm going to choose you, you, and you, and you, that was a black box, but our community actually was comfortable with that. It was humans making decisions. People like humans making decisions. Even if the human is flawed, they prefer a human to make those decisions. So we have always been very clear that whatever we do is to support a human decision maker, not to replace them. And that has improved the comfort levels of the communities that we work with. Of course, you can identify children at risk of these events, but can we prevent them? And that's a conversation we've been having in the last two days in Chile, but we've been having it internationally. Can we prevent, if we can predict, can we prevent? And risk is not the same as being Amenable, being able to be changed through the pro programs you have. Okay, so I'm gonna, um, I'll skip this for now. I'm gonna go through a case study and I'll come back to that slide. So the context here is the US. The US system has child abuse hotline. So a neighbor, a family, a person in the street, a teacher can ring a child abuse hotline to say that they're concerned that a child is being abused. In the US, you have about 3.6 million calls a year. This number is increasing because they have an opioid crisis. What happens when that person calls is there is a caseworker at the end of that line, often without any much training, some training, and they have to decide whether they need to investigate this case or not. Now you can imagine how difficult that decision is. Every call is a potential child being physically tortured or being sexually abused. Every call is that. But they don't have the resources to go out on every call. 50% of calls that come into the child hotline in the US are screened out. That is, they say, oh, we don't think there's an issue here, and they leave it. 50% they drive out and investigate. Now the amazing statistic from the US is one in three children in the US before they turn 18 has been investigated for child abuse. Are you shocked? I, I say this to American audiences all the time and they can't believe it, they can't believe it. They can't believe it because everyone in the audience knows no one who's been investigated. And my point is, there's no one in this room who's been investigated. There are people out there where everyone's been investigated. And that's often poor families and families who are black and African American. So you can be sure there are communities out there where people are calling in and they're driving, them, driving out and investigating them all the time. So one of the use problems for this type of system is we're trying to make incredibly important decisions at the click of on the, on the turn of a dime, really. You don't know whether you're doing it. When you find children who then subsequently died of maltreatment deaths or be nearly killed and go back, we were seeing lots of children where calls had come in and they were being screened out. So we know our screening, we knew our screening systems weren't working well. So that's the problem and what we wanted to do was to start a little pilot study in a state, uh, in Pennsylvania state, in a county called Allegheny, which is basically Pittsburgh. And so we built this algorithm because Pennsylvania, uh, Pittsburgh has a very particular kind of data system. 
where you can see data on, they have an in, what's called an integrated data system. So you can, there's a in, unique client ID that lets you see their public welfare, their parental child abuse history, family welfare, behavioral health, mental health services, county prison, alcohol and drug and juvenile justice. So all the public services being provided and funded by this system is linked together. So that for, if you put a first name, last name, date of birth, social security number into their data warehouse, you can pull out of that client data every health service that client has ever had publicly funded, every welfare check the client has ever had publicly funded, whether the client themselves were investigated, and so on. So it's an integrated data system. So we built an algorithm which basically goes as follows. A call comes in, the system immediately, once the person on has, who's taking the call has identified the name, first name, last name, social security number of the child who we think is a victim, and then try to find out by calling other people who their mom might be. Once that's been identified, the algorithm can then grab all this data around the child and put it into an algorithm. And basically, you can think of the algorithm as follows. It, the new child, mom and dad, on this call, it goes and takes history for mom. Was mom ever victimized? herself. Did mom have children removed from her previously because of fears that she was going to harm the child? Was the alleged perpetrator ever a perpetrator in previous calls? So it's doing that immediately. It's pulling all the data about this call. Simply put, what the algorithm does is it says, let's now look at historically but now let's look at children whose history looked like this child. It might find a thousand of those. Because it's found it in historical data, it can follow those children and say how likely is it that those children are going to end up being maltreated, for example. And it can give a score of 1 to 20, where 20 says, that the child looks like the kinds of children we've seen before who are at very high risk of being removed from home, basically, in the next two years. When it gives it a low risk, it says this child's history in the data system looks like children who in the data system had very low probability of placement. So the 1 to 20 basically tells you whether this child is kind of in the top 5% of risk as historically pattern or at the lowest level of risk of a particular outcome. So when you build an algorithm like this, the algorithm is trained to predict a particular outcome. In this use case, we trained the algorithm to predict whether the child in the next two years following the call would have be removed from home because they were worried that it was going to be harmed. So how accurate is it? There are all kinds of accuracy measures. I'm sure you're going to learn from your <coughs> professors here. But here's a very simple way of saying accuracy, which is the positive predictive value. If a child scored 20, we could follow them in the data historically. So we went back and scored the children who already existed. We then followed those children in the data because these were historical cases. And we said if they had come in and were scored at 20 by our algorithm, how many of them ended up being placed, the thing we were trying to predict? So one in two children in the highest risk ended up being placed. One in a hundred children in the lowest risk ended up being placed. Now, 
when you want to understand how good an algorithm is, this is not enough for you. What you want to do is say, is this going to improve or worsen our decision making? Because we have someone making decisions, we're going to give them the score. How well are they making decisions now compared to how they would with the score? Are you with me? We're not going to replace them with an algorithm. We're going to give it to them. So what we did is try to understand how they were making decisions right now when they didn't see the score. So we could go back and see what they had done for children who were 20s and what they had done for children who were ones. And the striking thing is that one in three children who were 20s had been ignored, screened out. 48% of children who were ones had been investigated. And yet, those children only had a 1.4% chance of ending up placed. So we had gone out into whole communities and investigated the hell out of them when we need not have. Meanwhile, and it's every investigation and service is 22 hours of a person's time. So we had gone out and done all this work for families who the algorithm would have told you had no chance of ever having, to needing our service. Meanwhile, we had ignored a full third of the kids who we could have been giving early prevention services too. So one of the concerns of algorithms like this, which our communities are very concerned about this type of thing, is they say, but all you're doing is predicting your own actions. Are these children who you call a 20 really at harm? Or are they just more likely to be placed? If you're placing poor children, if you're placing African American and black children, well, you're gonna just predict that you think in future you're going to want to place them. Are they really at harm? So what we did is we linked, we linked the hospital records with our restored children. And we asked ourselves, are children, they're all children someone had called up about and said, we think this child is being abused. Did the child who scored 20, were they more likely to have something terrible happened to them. Well, a child who scored 20 was 21 times more likely to be hospitalized for suicide or self-harm between the ages of 10 and 18 than a child who scored one. They were 17 times more likely to be hospitalized between any up to 17 years old for being a victim of physical assault and injury than a child who scored one. So this is sometimes what we call external validation. It's not enough to say we're well, doing well predicting the thing we're predicting. We want to know, are we identifying families and children who are at risk of the types of harms that our programs are designed to prevent? So you need to broaden out your lens and figure that out. So how long have I got? Um, 45 minutes. 45 minutes, okay, all right. I don't know how long my words will last, so we might just, I'm, I'm coming down with a bit of a cold, so I'll keep talking. So this is uh, the same information in just a plot to show you that that gradient between the horizontal line, which tells you the risk score, and the vertical line, which is hospitalization rates in the hospital data. So the top left is the self-inflicted injury and suicide. There's a gradient. This is being a victim of struck object or person. This is physical activity injury, which is uh, a very sub small subgroup. And this is just general physical assault. So what this is telling you is that right across the scores, the model is quite sensitive to the kinds of harm that if we had gone in front of this child early, we're trying to pre prevent. <coughs> Okay, I'm going to take you right back to that slide there. Okay, so we put this model in, and uh, unlike Cambridge Analytica, there were, well, let's put it this way, there were detractors, some people, a woman who wrote a book about our project, uh, Virginia Eubank, said we were just, um, she calls it automating inequality because we were using data 
that was over surveillance on poor people to predict uh, something that was about harm. So she had a kind of, she was an activist and she had a negative lens about it. A New York Times reporter followed us around for a year and wrote a very nice and in-depth piece in the New York Times saying that this was really a very positive project. Why did we get such, um, and we've had positive press in lots of places, why did we get, why did we avoid the front page immigration scandal, the front page Cambridge Analytica scandal? Because the data science piece of it is a tiny piece. It's a multidisciplinary t 